Good morning and welcome back to this series of tutorials on plant simulation. In the last videos, we have simulated a complex logistics flow, which includes the use and management of objects such as pick and place, assembly station, tracks and transfer stations. Today, we will make that flow even more realistic by adding a transversal element that is shared by the majority of the industry, the deployment of operators to perform various tasks. Specifically, with respect to the exercise in the previous video, we are going to add operators to the parts of the flow that appear highlighted in orange. On the one hand, we will make both the container transport and the production of the three stations manual, and we will add failure rates to the palletizing and depalletizing stations that will require maintenance. Just like we did in the previous video, I have made a copy of the last exercise and changed the path of the parts in the data table to update them to the new class. In addition, I have also added my own connector to the exercise library so that I do not have to change tabs in the toolbox. Let's start modifying the model. All the objects that we are going to need for today's video will be found in the Resources tab, which we had not seen until now. The first thing we are going to need is the Worker Pool object, which represents a waiting room for our team of workers. It is the place where they will wait for us to assign them tasks, and from where we will configure how many we need. If we open the menu, we will see that the object does not have many configuration tabs. Basically, we are interested in the first one, Attributes. To begin with, we see that the first option allows us to define a worker creation table, but if we open it and try to edit it, we'll see that it won't let us. If we close the table and look closely at the menu, we can guess where the problem comes from. As we see, next to the button to open the table, there is a green box that tells us that the table is inheriting its contents from its class. But unlike the rest of the fields, in this case the inheritance is not automatically cut when editing the table, but rather we must cut it manually. Now if we reopen the table, we can edit it to our liking. In this table, we can define the number of operators that we want to instantiate from as many classes as we are interested in, and specify specific attributes for each one, such as speed or efficiency. We will explain all the fields in this table in detail later. To begin with, let's create our own worker class and define it as the work class in the table. The worker is this object here, and the icon represents a person seen from above with their arms outstretched. For now, let's leave the rest of the table as is and save the changes. Below the table, we find two other options. The first two allow us to decide if the operators must return to the worker pool every time a task finishes to assign the next one, and if the tasks can be solved remotely from the worker pool or must be done in person. We will see the rest of the options later. For now, we are going to leave everything by default, save and close. Let's start by implementing manual container transportation. Before we continue, we will make some changes to make it easier for the flow to work. We will eliminate the conveyor, and in its place we will install two buffers, both at the output of the dismantle station and at the input of the flow control. The idea is that the palletizing station accumulates the containers that are left over in the buffer, and the operator takes them and leaves them in the waiting buffer at the entrance of the assembly station which must continue to have entry priority, as we have already seen in the previous video. For the material flow to continue working, we must ensure that we respect the successors and predecessors defined for both cases. In my model, I just need to modify the flow control so that the predecessor coming from the buffer is number one. Therefore, I will delete this one and create it again. The next object that we are going to need for working with operators is the workplace, which acts as a link between the operator and the rest of the material flow objects in our model. We must connect it to the worker pool so that it recognizes it. When instantiated normally, we will see that the icon is transparent. The workplace is telling us that it is not associated with any object, so let's drag it to the buffer. As we see, it has now been automatically painted gray. If we leave the mouse over it, we will see the installation to which it is associated, as well as if we open the object's menu. We will repeat this same process with the other buffer. If we now start the model and move forward a little in time, we will see how the operator is created, but he does not come to do the work, even though he has the two associated positions. This occurs because we are missing two key elements to configure. On the one hand, we are going to need a broker object. The broker represents the figure of the plant supervisor or team coordinator, the person who receives all the requests and assigns them to each available operator according to different parameters.
To use it, we simply drag it on top of the worker pool. If we open the menu, it only allows us to add our own code to customize this task assignment, but this is not within the scope of this course, so we are going to leave it as default. In addition to the broker, we need the buffer to request an operator every time a container enters to transport it to the other buffer. To do this, we will open the buffer menu and go to the importer tab, which we had not mentioned until now. In this tab, we can request services that we want an operator to provide us. In the case of the buffer, the only service we can request is transport, as we see here at the top. For now, we are simply going to activate the import of services, and we are going to define in MU target the destination that we want the operator to take the containers, which in our case is buffer 3. Now if we start the simulation again and move forward in time, we see how the containers are already moving from one buffer to the other. However, this transportation is immediate, and in real life the operator would have to walk to be able to move the containers. To simulate this well, we're going to need the footpath object. This object works just like a track, but is designed specifically for operators. So let's create a path between the two workplaces and connect everything together. Additionally, we are going to open the Destination Workplace menu and deactivate the Worker Stays Here after completing the Job option. In this way, we ensure that after each service it returns to the Worker Pool and thus save movement time. If we run the simulation again and move forward a little, this time we will see how the operator takes the container from one buffer to the other manually. The next thing we are going to model are the manual stations, that is, the three classification stations cannot pre-process a part if there is no operator in them. To do this, we are going to create workplaces and footpaths as we have done so far with the buffers. We must ensure that the connections are well made between all the elements, as I am showing you on the screen. Otherwise, plant simulation will give us a warning and we will have to stop the simulation. As the three stations share the same parent class, and there are no more stations in the entire model, we're going to configure the importer directly in the parent. Unlike the case of the buffer, we can now see that there are four different services that we can activate. Processing of parts, setup, failures, and transportation. In our case, we are going to configure only part processing. Therefore, we activate it. We save the changes and run the model again. We see how our operator is now a Moonlighter. It must coordinate both the transportation of containers and the service to the different stations. Let's diversify the team a little. We open the Worker Pool Creation Table again, and we are going to create a new entry to create another type of operator. In the Amount or Quantity field, we define that two of this type are created. Both will be instances of the same class parent worker as you can see, but we are going to differentiate them by the type of service they can offer. For the first team, in the Additional Services field, we are going to define a service that we will call Transportation, while to the other we will associate a service that we will call Process. We now have two teams of operators specialized in different tasks. We save the changes, and we are going to configure the different objects that we have seen so that they request these specific services. So we open the Buffer, Import tab, and we are going to cut the inheritance of the Services table and open it. As we see, by default it appears that it requests the standard service, that is, any operator will work. We are going to modify it so that it specifically requests the Transport service. We will do the same with the parent class of the station, but we will ask it to request the Process service. At this point, I would like to clarify that the names of the services can be whatever we want. The important thing is that they coincide between the worker pool and the different objects that request them. 
If we run the simulation again and advance a little, we will see how the transport operators dedicate themselves exclusively to it, while the other two take turns at the three workstations. Finally, we have to add the maintenance operators at the palletizing and depalletizing stations. To do this, the first thing we will have to do is define failure profiles in the assembly station and the dismantle station. We open both objects, click on the failure tabs, and click on new to add a new machine failure profile. This tab was already explained in the third video of this series, so I won't go into details. We will define an availability of 80% for both. Next, we will go to the Importer tab, Failure sub-tab, and we will activate the service on both stations. Also, since this is a bottleneck in our model, we want an operator to come as soon as possible when it fails, so we are going to give it more priority. To do this, we are going to modify the priority box. The higher the degree of priority, the sooner an operator will be assigned by the broker, but since in the rest we have zero, indicating one here will be enough. We are also going to model the workplaces and the footpath, as we have seen in the previous cases, so that the operator can reach them. If we leave it as it is and press play, every time one of the stations fails, an operator from any piece of equipment will go to do the maintenance. This happens because we have not defined a specific service. We are going to make the transport operator also in charge of maintenance. So we reset the model, access the worker pool creation table, and change the service name to transport slash maintenance. Next, we change it both in the assembly, in the dismantle, and in the buffer. In the case of dismantle and assembly, we must remember to also deactivate the inheritance of the service table. If we now run it again, what we see is that only the transport operator is the one who is going to solve the machine failures. With this, we would have the flow completely modeled, but to make it more realistic, we are going to define that the operators work in shifts. To do this, we will need to work with the shift calendar object. This object allows us to define as many work shifts as we want, the days of the week to which it applies, and even the scheduled breaks for each shift. By default, it is configured with two eight-hour shifts, five working days a week, and with two breaks per shift. Let's modify it. We cut the inheritance of the table, just as we have seen until now, and we change the names of the shifts to morning and afternoon. In the Calendar tab, we can also define the holidays to take into account, but we are going to leave it as default. Now we simply drag over the worker pool to associate it, and we are also going to create two teams for each shift and modify their colors to be able to differentiate them. We will create a new class worker. Then we will rename both of them as transport underscore maintenance and process. And we will also change the icon to the process worker. Now we will modify the worker pool creation table so that it is as I show you on the screen. We are going to assign the first two teams to the morning shift and the last two to the afternoon shift using the shift column. In addition, we have configured different numbers of operators for each team depending on the shift. If we now run the simulation, we will see the flow completely working. However, how can we know which shift we are on at any given time? Well, it's simple. In the event controller, if we click on the time button, the display will change between total simulation time and simulated time of day. This time starts counting from the date that we configure in the date field of the settings tab. We are going to define that the simulation starts at 10 to 9, 
so that we can see the behavior of the model during a pause. So let's restart. If we run the model and move forward to 9 o'clock, which is the time of the first break, we will see that all the workers return to the worker pool and the model stops completely during the 15 minutes that the break lasts. With this, we have already seen the most important option objects for modeling operators in our simulation. In the next video, we will see how to build our own objects to create more modular simulations, giving a new use to the frames thanks to the interface object. Greetings and until the next video.